Welcome to this webinar by the Middle East Institute. I'm Karen Young. I'm a senior fellow and director of the program on economics and energy at the Middle East Institute. And uh, really excited today to talk about the launch of a new book. And here it is. It's called Oil and the Political Economy in the Middle East, edited by Martin Beck and Thomas Richter. And um, we're gonna have a couple of the other chapter contributors with us today. We have Emma Adley and we have Matthew Gray with us. Um, I also have a chapter, but I'm not gonna talk about my chapter. Um, it's important to you know, sort of reflect on um, what we thought the, uh, the Middle East would look like after the decline in oil prices in late 2014 and where we've ended up. I think we've seen a lot of change obviously with the COVID pandemic. Um, the twin crises again of, of a sharp decline in oil price in 2020, and now this moment of very, very high prices again. So, you know, if you're studying the political economy of the MENA region, um, there's never a shortage of uh, volatility. So um, our program today, we're going to have uh, the editors speak a bit about the project and this book, um, and then we'll hear from Emmer and Matthew about their uh, individual chapters and some reflections on the research that they did and, and where things sort of look now. And then we'll just have a, an open conversation um, on thinking about the region um, and the kind of direction of, uh, of where we're going in energy markets. Um, we do have a uh, question and answer function. If you are joining us uh, from uh, the YouTube streaming, you can send a question to events at mei.edu. Um, and if you're joining us by live stream, you can use the, um, the Q&A function to submit a question. Uh, and then I hope that we can get to a lot of them in this hour. So please let me again introduce first uh, Martin Beck, who's a professor at the University of Southern Denmark, joining us today from, uh, from Beirut. Um, yes. And, Hi. and uh, Thomas Richter, who's senior fellow at the German Institute for Global and Area Studies, also called uh, GIGA, uh, joining us from Hamburg. Amar Adley, who is assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the American University in Cairo, joining us from Cairo today. Um, and Matthew Gray, a professor in the School of International Liberal Studies at Waseda University in Japan, and he's joining us from Tokyo. So what a wonderful use of Zoom today. We really are convening together from all corners um, of Europe and the Middle East and Asia and uh, North America. So um, warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for, um, for getting the book out, you know, in a difficult time to do collaborative work. Um, so maybe let me hand it over to Martin and Thomas to talk a little bit about the project and, uh, and tell us how we got to this. <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Karen. Uh, I may start. Um, uh, and the Middle East Institute and the new program on economics and energy, congratulations to that um, as well. Um, it's a pleasure and a big honor to have that opportunity here to talk about uh, the book, um, Oil and the Political Economy in the Middle East, um, post-2014 adjustment policies of the Arab Gulf and beyond. This is the long title of it. Uh, my main focus um, at the beginning will be on three aspects. I uh, briefly uh, start by uh, looking at the main questions being discussed in the volume. Then secondly, I would briefly talk about the character of the book and how did it evolve. And then uh, finally look at the structure of the volume. So first, let me start by highlighting the main focus of the book. So the basic idea was um, uh, comes from the external shock experienced by the Middle East due to the sharp drop in oil prices that started in the middle of 2014. This first wave of oil price declines in, in the 21st century generated enormous pressure over af uh, after over a decade of very high income from hydrocarbon exports in the region. And in the volume, we explore the effects of this price drop on the different national political economies. Uh, more specifically, we ask what are the major repercussions within the six net exporters of, hydrocarbon, of hydrocarbons in the Arab Middle East, the six member states of the GCC. And also how the oil price decline has impacted upon three net hydrocarbon importers, Egypt, Jordan, and Lebanon. Um, as for my second point, uh, the volume is primarily an academic book, and this comes with advantages and disadvantages. 
As for the latter, the book is uh, not discussing the most recent events and dynamics. However, I believe advantages prevail and we do have a perspective looking at the policy reactions and the impacts within each of the nine countries under study between late 2014 until approximately 2019. And in the comparative chapter at the end, Martin and I also briefly discussed some of the early reactions to the COVID pandemic. And I hope, as uh, Karen uh, mentioned at the beginning, that we can elaborate on this also for the more recent um, period. Um, the book evolved over a series of steps. Um, so in late 2017 already, uh, Martin and I started to write a book proposal reached out to the authors. Then we wrote the first version of the initial chapter in late 2018. We met for a very fruitful authors workshop in Beirut in March 2019, discussing all of the draft papers. Uh, and we submitted the manuscript for final review in uh, June 2020. And then one year, over one year later, the book was published by Manchester University Press. So now we are happy to have it. Um, so finally, uh, let's briefly look at the structure of the book. It's very straightforward. We start with an initial chapter written by Martin and me, where we discuss the general context and theorize a little, about, a little bit about the possible policy adjustments in reaction to the oil price drop of 2014. And then this chapter is follow, followed by nine country chapters. So uh, the chapter on Bahrain is written by Sumaya al Jazeri. The Kuwait chapter is written by Gertian Hötjes. The Oman chapter is uh, co-authored by Crystal Annes and uh, Said al Sakri. Uh, the chapter uh, on Qatar is uh, 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 written by Matthew Gray. He is with us today and we'll say in a few minutes um, uh, something about uh, his findings, I guess. Um, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the analysis is written by Robert Mason. As Karen said at the beginning, uh, her chapters on the United Arab Emirates. Um, and then we move on with the net ag importers. Uh, Amra Adli uh, wrote uh, the chapter about Egypt. He is also with us today. Uh, the Jordan chapter is written by Riyad al khouri and Emily uh, Solchak. And uh, Lebanon, uh, the analysis has been uh, was written by Mohammed Karaki. The final chapter by Martin and me uh, takes stock about the main findings uh, from the nine uh, country chapters. And we also reflect at the end a bit about the idea of the rentier state and rentierism and what this means in the current context, um, uh, more specifically uh, looking at the oil price declines uh, since 2014. So that's from all from my side for, for the beginning. Back to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Thomas. And, uh, and Martin, I'd, I'd like to hear from you too about maybe reflecting a bit on, you know, being in Beirut again now, so different than we were all when we were all together um, for our workshop, when the city seems so, you know, so vibrant and, um, you know, really kind of like turning a corner and, and gosh, things changed in two years. So, um, you know, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the um, the funding and and sort of the uh, the impetus for the collaboration and and what it's like maybe now. You know, if we tried to do this project again, um, where could we all be together and and what would what would that be like? Yeah. Um, let me start, please, um, Karen. First of all, thanks a lot um, for the to the organizers and also particularly to you, Karen, um, to, to give us the chance, um, me, Thomas and me, the chance to share with you some of our major findings. And of course, I can't help uh, just to talk a bit about the major findings of the book first. Um, we believe that the post-2014 oil price decline is not just cyclical, but most likely marks structural change. Why is that so? Major present reason would be hydraulic fracturing has become commercial. And uh, a likely future reason is that en energy production will depend less on hydrocarbons. As a result of the oil price decline, the long era of oil income abundance in the Arab Gulf has come to an end. This trend from oil income 
abundance to oil income scarcity puts strong pressure on the Arab Gulf regimes to launch adjustment policies. We examined adjustment policies on the international and the domestic level. Most important on the international level because most effective is cooperation in oil policies in the frame of OPEC+. It even proved to be ro robust, this arrangement of OPEC+, Plus, in the wake of the pandemic-induced price crash in 2020. And all this, although a graduated prisons dilemma puts high structural obstacles to successful cooperation. Our major finding on domestic adjustment policies is as reforms measures are effectively applied to migrant workers own, they carry the burden of adjustment policies. Why is that so? Um, Non-citizens are constrained by the kafala system, where citizens have leverage through clientelist relations with members of the political class. So this book is not only about the GCC members, but also in Egypt, Amr is with us, Jordan and Lebanon, all of whom depend on patrolism. Common wisdom would suggest that decreased rent income and lower energy bills would boost the productive parts of the economy. However, in Egypt, Jordan and Lebanon, institutions deeply affected by structures of rentierism turned out to be rather resilient. Beyond empirical findings, we are, have also elaborated, Thomas said so already, on two theoretical findings. With regards to class relations, we got inspired by Delacroix's dictum, quote, to be of capitalism is not the same as being a capitalist society, unquote. We elaborated on this idea as an alternative to concepts of state capitalism. And we believe, we came to the conclusion that the dominant class in the Arab Gulf is a non-capitalist state class. Another theoretical funding, finding is that historical institutionalism helps to comprehend the particularities of adjustment policies. Regarding international adjustment policies, the main reason for the success of OPEC plus is Saudi Arabia's and others long experience in oil cooperation. With regards to domestic adjustment policies, differences are a result of various historical development paths and country-specific institutional profiles. So thanks for your attention so far. And I, I don't know, Karen, whether you still want me to say something else um, I mean, about, about uh, yeah. Lebanon. Well, I mean, yes, I think, you know, beyond, this is doing okay. both, you know, empirical work and, and theoretical, as you've described in these chapters. And I think you know your point really on this widening gap um, within the region between exporters and importers, and and the, the what the World Bank has been studying in terms of the um, the vulnerability to exogenous shock, right? And so when we would expect that lower oil prices would have had a better boost towards productivity and yeah. growth in the uh, in the importers, but it didn't, right? It, it um, did not that, at that's, all. That's um, that's a really important finding, which I think is being you know replicated by many other studies right now, um, and and that tells us a lot about the region, um, and tells us a lot to be quite cautious about the next period that we're in. But I, my first question to you was really more about um, just sort of reflecting on the process of you know putting an edited volume together, um, you know the the people in the institutions which supported the effort. I mean, I think we have to we have to thank Giga for uh, for some of that, um, and certainly to um, to Martin and Thomas for you know being our our, our herders um, because it's it's really hard to get people um, you know from different academic disciplines from different uh, geographic yeah. locations and different um, kind of ways of working and studying to to do a collaborative projects and I and I wonder what you think kind of in this current you know Zoom reality that we all have has this you know helped or harmed our ability to do this kind of academic and, and scholarly work together. I mean, I, I think um, Beirut has certainly helped. I mean, one, one organization we also, I mean, they, they, they um, uh, provide us with the facilities, um, Kuluna Irara, and, and maybe here also a very positive aspect. There are not many positive aspects on, on Lebanon these days, but 
you know, it's a rather, still a rather free um, society. So you can, you can organize a very critical workshop with even some ideas that, uh, you know, that, that might raise aspects such as authoritarianism and so on, which would not be possible, let's say, in all Arab countries. But of course, um, we see in these days mainly the negative um, effects of rentierism. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say that the oil price decline is, a major, is the major factor explaining this catastrophic development in Beirut. But, but certainly factors related to what we call rentierism. I mean, Lebanon is a semi-rentier state. And it somehow failed. I mean, after it failed to uh, acquire rents, and this happened uh, through through the financial sector here. I mean, they they had they had offered for for many years um, incredibly high interest rates on dollar accounts. I mean, on on what they call today dollars, actually. I mean, Lebanese dollars, because they they had interest rates that attracted foreign money, mainly from migrant workers and also from the Gulf. But this all was based on, 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 a, on a kind of Ponzi scheme. So, so when, when, the first, when the first billionaires of, of, of Lebanon, this happened actually in, in uh, just a couple of months before, before the COVID-19, when they withdrew money, Big accounts from Lebanon, then then the whole system crumbled, and and then, I mean, today we have we have on the black market you get you you get um, for one dollar uh, for, for 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 one dollar you better get get um, twenty times more than you used to get. I mean, Lebanese pound, and this means I mean for the for the people, poverty. And, and it, it also means that, that the whole system, and even the middle class now, is not a, any more able to, to get, I mean, to use their Lebanese, their Lebanese salaries for a, decent, for a decent life. Something related directly to oil is that, that most people can even not afford fuel anymore. For a certain period, there was fuel shortage because it was still um, subsidized. And then, then um, you know, fuel stations were reluctant to sell the, the, oil, the oil, I mean, the fuel for, for, for the subsidized price. Now you have more or less something like a market price, but which means that nowadays um, you can, you can uh, drive with, I mean, there are no traffic jams anymore in Beirut, which is, if you have ever been here in, in Beirut, in the good old times or not so good old times, then it was always fully jammed. Now you can just drive 80, 80 kilometers, I mean, or 60 miles in the city without any, any interruption, because also there are no traffic, uh, traffic lights anymore. They, can't, they don't produce enough power, electricity, to, to still run um, the, the traffic lights. So it, it really, I mean, energy, oil, politics also affects daily life to a very high, to a very high degree. I think that's a that's an apt um, description, and uh, and I I think it actually kind of segues nicely into um, Amar Adli's chapter, which is again this discussion of uh, of rentierism or what he calls Egypt's twisted hydrocarbon dependency. A case of a case of persistent semi-rentierism. So, Amar, you know, what are these distortive effects that Martin is describing, um, you know, so eloquently in in what we see in Beirut? But how do you see that in the Egyptian case, in the volatility of uh, of, of oil markets, and and then what are the repercussions um, that you have studied in this chapter? So uh, thanks a lot, Karen, and, and, and thanks. Uh, like I would like to thank everyone uh, for inviting me over for this uh, uh, like uh, this panel. Uh, the the selection of uh, of Egypt among other cases uh, of countries that are clearly net energy importers uh, and at least net uh, oil uh, uh, importers 
uh, is quite uh, interesting because uh, by definition, rentier states are uh, like usually the ones that are rich in the natural resources that generate such rents. Uh, and that's why Egypt uh, most probably never qualified into being a fully fledged rentier state. So from the very uh, early contributions, it was held as uh, like an economy that is diversified, but with serious uh, rentier features. Uh, and uh, this is the, the tradition that uh, I, I try to contribute to because, of course, the uh, semi uh, like categories that start with the, the, the semi adjective uh, are uh, inherently uh, like ambiguous. They are vague. They are something in between. So uh, I try to uh, engage uh, with the, 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 the bigger discussion because it is impacting a country like Egypt one of the most populous uh, countries in the Middle East and, uh, and, and North Africa, uh, but not in a very straightforward uh, way. So uh, what I tried to, to do here is to, uh, first of all, conceptualize what semi-rentierism means. Uh, and this leads to more of a sectoral approach rather than a macro approach to rentierism. So uh, still dependency on direct and indirect oil rents. Uh, and here, of course, not only oil, of course, like natural gas as well. And that's why it's, it's hydrocarbons. Uh, it, uh, it's not only about Egypt being an exporter uh, of uh, oil. Egypt does export oil until now, even though it imports more than it exports. Uh, but Egypt, of course, is a net uh, exporter of natural gas. This is something that uh, was renewed as of 2014 or 2015, even though this is not likely to uh, render Egypt a net uh, energy exporter uh, anytime uh, soon, uh, of course, because we consume lots of energy. Uh, so th this is uh, one thing. However, uh, I tried to bring in many of the rather political uh, rather like not economic channels through which uh, rents are redistributed on a regional level. And here, of course, Martin's story uh, uh, in reference to Lebanon uh, uh, is quite familiar. So uh, remittances, for instance, uh, have been an understudied uh, topic, unfortunately, because we don't have the, the empirics that can enable us to do so. But nowadays, uh, and for the past five or six years, by the way, remittances uh, have on average hovered between 20 and 30 billion dollars a year, which is something uh, uh, around four to six times uh, the Suez Canal revenue. Uh, yet it doesn't receive the, the very uh, uh, same uh, uh, attention. And of course, the bulk of these remittances uh, emanate from uh, oil rich uh, countries, uh, primarily the GCC uh, countries, where you have around 3 million Egyptians uh, working. Uh, as part of uh, a temporary pattern of, uh, of migration uh, that encourages uh, uh, sending their savings uh, as well as part of their income back home. So remittances are extremely important because uh, uh, they are not simply uh, a market-based labor capital exchange. Uh, as uh, uh, Martin uh, 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 like, uh, said, uh, access to labor markets in these capital-rich countries uh, is very politicized uh, and uh, is, is, is quite uh, is heavily regulated on national basis. It's very much related to how na na like uh, 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 na like uh, nationhood uh, and the sense of nationalism uh, has been defined vis-a-vis -vis, uh, an expat community uh, that overwhelmingly constitutes the labor force. And hence, this is a very important part that needs to be brought in. Uh, it, 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 Egypt is, is a case in point, but that applies to Sudan, it applies to Le Lebanon, it applies to Jordan, definitely, it applies to, the, the, to, to Palestine, to Yemen, no doubt. Uh, so this is one element that I tried to bring in uh, as a, more of a political economic rather than a purely uh, market-driven uh, element. Of course, the, the uh, aid that Egypt uh, uh, received in many guises uh, that was crucial in the kind of stabilization uh, on political and security terms uh, after 2013 is another aspect that I treat, uh, together with investment and private investment, even if it is private, sometimes, of course, it's public because you have sovereign funds, or investors that are uh, very much uh, close to uh, governments uh, in the oil-rich countries, given how state and business uh, uh, relations are uh, uh, quite close to each other. So all of these are uh, political, economic, indirect channels through which uh, much of the energy-related rent uh, got redistributed since the first oil shock and, and onwards. It creates its own dynamics. It creates its own institutional settings on the regional as well as domestic levels uh, that uh, fit very much into uh, uh, Terry Lincoln's story about Venezuela 
uh, the one that was put in the late 1990s. It's an old book, but it's quite relevant. It's about how these institutions are very sticky to the extent that they don't adjust to uh, booms and busts in, uh, in energy uh, prices. They just like linger. Uh, and this is uh, to a great extent what we have been seeing. Uh, one uh, uh, relatively uh, uh, good thing about the, 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 the about the like uh, uh, Egypt, relatively, I mean, is that uh, the decline in exports uh, in oil uh, and natural uh, gas, like uh, or, overall, and uh, not in absolute terms, I mean, like as a percentage of total uh, uh, exports, did not lead to an overall decline in uh, uh, total exports. And this means that uh, there is a very slow uh, uh, like movement into diversifying away from uh, depending on energy in order to uh, uh, mainly export, as well as to attract foreign direct investment, by the way, which is like ridiculously uh, uh, concentrated in, uh, in, in, in the oil and natural gas extraction. However, as a net oil importer, Egypt should have uh, benefited much more considerably uh, from low oil uh, prices, like international oil uh, prices, which is something that did not happen and was captured by uh, many reports, like the most important of them was the, the one of the, of, the, of the World Bank, that focused more on the very sharp depreciation of the Egyptian pound that did not translate into a significant increase in exports. What I would add to this, uh, the, uh, the sustained decline in oil prices uh, for a country that ex uh, imports more than it exports uh, in oil, not, not to mention natural gas. Anyway, it has its own dynamics and it, it doesn't constitute until now the bulk of, of energy consumption in Egypt. So uh, this, again, raises an institutional question in a new, uh, like not a new category, but a category that has usually been overlooked, that of semi rentier cases that seem to be very vulnerable, uh, even more vulnerable than extremely oil rich countries especially the ones that could amass uh, uh, big reservations, uh, big big reserves uh, during the boon years. Uh, uh, countries like uh, Jordan, like Lebanon, like uh, Egypt seem to be much more vulnerable, uh, I, I, like ironically and unfortunately to both. Like they, they seem to suffer when there is a, a drop in, in energy price, international energy prices, and they seem to suffer uh, when there are uh, 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 like increases in, 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 in international energy prices as well. Uh, and, and this is extremely curious. And that's why I, I thought of it as twisted uh, in all senses, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amr. I, there was a lot in there. And really, I think we want to unpack a bit of what you've been saying. And, and, and I love your reference to Terry Lynn Carl's work. That's uh, you're exactly right. It's still very, very relevant. Um, but you know, you've discussed very much from the importer perspective um, and the, the focus on remittances, yeah, cannot be underestimated. I've seen a statistic actually for Egypt, remittances in the fiscal year 2020 to 2021 were $34 billion. So you know, the, the very high end of the estimate. So it's, it's, it's amazing you know, how that dwarfs um, FDI even, you know, and, uh, and certainly even access to, um, to, uh, to loans uh, in the Egyptian case. So let's turn now to the, uh, the exporter story. Um, and Matthew Gray has a chapter on Qatar. It's, um, let me get the title, Qatar Leadership Transition, Regional Crisis, and the Imperatives for Reform. So Matthew is going to tell us a little bit about his chapter, his work on Qatar. Um, but also, I wonder, Matthew, if you could tell us, sort of reflecting where we are now, and of course, Qatar is more in the gas business and the oil business, um, you know, the positioning and the imperative. Do you think that has changed at all? Um, but but I, I give the floor to you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, look, thank you, Karen, for putting uh, putting this morning together. And um, thank you uh, again to Thomas and, and Martin. I think I thank you both separately, but um, thank you for involving me today as well. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, your introduction there, Karen, sort of, um, <clears throat> is a very good entree into what I was going to say, which is... Um, when I was doing the chapter, I was setting out to do a couple of things. One was to uh, have a particular look at Qatar and its unique elements, particularly the fact they had a very new emir uh, in power in 2014. And then that year was not just the beginning of this period of low oil prices, but uh, the new emir was all, almost immediately tested which what turned with, with what turned out to be a... Um, I suppose, a sort of trial run for the so-called Qatar crisis that came in 2017. Uh, but there was sort of a, a mini Qatar crisis in 2014. And 
So this this very new uh, Amir had to deal with with both of these um, in in very short order, and um, the benefit I suppose that that Qatar had was that um, it is almost the sort of um, ultimate rentier uh, case study, if you like, and. I want to have a look at that with the chapter, but also delve a little bit more deeply into it. I think there's um, there's always an assumption with us when we're looking at the Gulf to sort of accept the rentierism at face value. Um, we might call it different things. We might call it, I mean, I did something calling it late rentierism at one point. People uh, will often just use the term of rentier or rentier state, but um, there is still more to it. And Tata provides almost a consummate example of how the rentierism is blended with other elements. And so I want to have a look at that. In particular, this very unique, um, I've called it at various times, uh, entrepreneurial form of state capitalism. And this is something which much of the Gulf has adopted. Essentially, where, where Gulf states have the capacity for this, they seem to have adopted it. So uh, Qatar, the UAE, um, Saudi are probably the three consummate examples of that, but um, all the GCC states have done this and you see elements of this uh, elsewhere. And so this is a little bit, this is sort of um, new, new state capitalism, but not as our parents knew it. This is um, state capitalism in, in a sort of much more um, risk tolerant, dynamic international uh, sort of way. And um, to me, this was sort of signifying part of the region finally coming to terms with the fact that it was uh, going into the second half of the oil era and it had to think of ways where it could diversify the economy and create jobs, but realistically, so not necessarily by a simple um, flowering of the private sector, but by a state-led form of, um, at least initially, of state capitalism where the state would foster uh, the development of some key industries that would perhaps spearhead that type of transition in the longer term. So I want to have a look at that and, and mix it. The first thing I mix it in with in, in my chapter is um, what I call economic statecraft. It's kind of a clumsy term, but I want to come up with something that talked about how Gulf uh, leaders have this very unique approach to uh, how they deal with the outside world economically but also what they want to receive from that. So as investors, um, in terms of putting on main major events, in terms of how they try to foster um, economic relationships with other countries, often in very calculated ways, what they're really looking for out of this is not just the financial return, but how that financial return is translated into domestic legitimacy and support back home. So... Um, Qatar, in, in certain respects, one person I remember um, when I was interviewing there, this was 10 years ago now, but it's it's still very apt. He sort of said, you know, when I started asking questions about national branding and all that stuff, he said, well, you know, this is a family business, this country. So um, you have to think of it in those terms. Uh, any branding, you know, trade policy is essentially, you know, the, the family businesses. Um, merchant policy, if you like. And so I sort of wanted to try and blend this together into the beginnings of what I hope would be a more coherent, longer term um, theoretical contribution to make. Um, this blend of late rentierism, state capitalism or entrepreneurial state capitalism and economic statecraft is sort of what I think is going to be the fundamental structure of the Gulf states uh, going into sort of the final decades of the oil era. Uh, they will play around with the relative weightings of those three things, but those three things will be the pillars in, I think, all the uh, Middle Eastern oil exporters and gas exporters. Um, just to wrap up, uh, Karen, you, you asked about um, Qatar's future directions. I think in many ways it's um, it, it still hasn't um, weaned itself off hydrocarbons. Uh, and... Qatar's gamble at the moment seems to be to maximise the revenue it's going to make out of uh, gas while time permits. Uh, so they're bringing several new gas trains on, on stream in, in, at the moment over a few years of the early 2020s. That's um, going to let them leapfrog Australia yet again to become the largest uh, gas producer in the world. 
Uh, they still have some vulnerabilities with this. They still sell too much on spot, for example, rather than um, with longer term contracts. And there's a vulnerability with that, but um, or at least a risk exposure with that. But um, but I think um, in some ways Qatar is is sitting well. The 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 gas era will outlast the the oil era at least um, a little bit, and um, I think the Qatar is kind of. Uh, realize that they realize also that they don't have a lot of time to to act here the the um uh non-carbon sources of energy are going to be um viable for most things in say three decades four decades that's the sort of time time frame i think that they're they're now looking at um and the, the sort of language we used to hear of um Qatar having 180 years worth of, of gas i think the um they don't have to worry about running out of gas. They have to worry about running out of the demand for gas. And then I think they've realized that. Thank you, Matthew. Well, certainly um, the LNG business has a longer runway than that of oil, but even not having long-term contracts right now is actually a benefit because the price of gas is so incredibly high. Um, but yes, this is um, this is a really interesting case. And, and I wonder if I could just ask you a question and then we'll go to the larger group what you make of the recent um, Shura Council elections in Qatar, you know, in this argument of the imperative for reform, while well, Qatar is certainly um, still very much um, a hydrocarbon centered economy, um, but yet there have been movements, um, you know, to implement more taxes, to allow more political participation, you know, is, is that a trade-off? How, how, do you, um, how do you explain that? No, I think I'm probably a little bit more cynical with it. And um, my my take on this has been promised for a very long time. Uh, these elections have been uh, stalled um, several times and postponed several times. Um, I kind of read it. This is a relatively small legislature. It's, it's 45 members, uh, 30 of them elected, 15 of them appointed. Um, we essentially saw a vote that was done very much along social and sociological lines. So uh, people sort of voting essentially for um, local people or people from an extended tribe and through other connections that would be a relatively um, a sort of safe person to represent their interests in this sort of body. Um, so it's not without meaning that, that Kato has done this, but it's something that they've been promising um, for well, I think since the early 2000s, so almost 20 years, this has been on the books. Uh, and we've had a more significant, you know, more specific postponement of it, I think, three or four times. Um, to me, it looks far more like a sort of uh, a combination, I suppose, of calculated decompression and also part of the uh, Qatari uh, government and state's attempts to present a very liberal image to the world. You know, part of their national branding has been to present an image that's a combination of um, you know, being really quite sort of liberal and open, open to business, like any good family business, but um, liberal-minded. You know, this was what was behind the creation and funding of Al Jazeera for a long time and still is. And, you know, they would blend that, of course, with um, a somewhat pious image as well, that they were not just liberal and open-minded, but they're also traditional and they're respectful of uh, the Islamic traditions of Qatar and of the region. Uh, and I think the elections are sort of just part of that messaging um, of sort of uh, places them in a position where they can make a claim to be um, on par with or even perhaps ahead of some of the other uh, neighbouring Gulf states, it presents them with some liberal credentials they can take to um, other countries and uh, perhaps use the consolidating relationships there. But um, I don't see this as part of a um, fundamental political reform. I think it's it's a um, little bit more modest in its uh, goals than that. Thank you, Matthew. So let me invite uh, anyone who's watching um, on the live stream or uh, on YouTube, please send us your questions, events at mei.edu or in the Q&A function. We've got a couple you could all see there that have uh, come in um, and I'll just open the floor. Also, if anyone you know, of the panelists wanted to have a follow-up remark 
Um, but one question, I think it's a quite good one. Why did we leave out Iran? Um, and you know, I think the honest answer is when you try to put a group of scholars together, you hope for the best, right? You hope for representation among the authors, among the cases, among the theoretical concepts being used. Um, and you don't always get a perfect mix. So maybe the editors could tell us how did you balance uh, in terms of you know, putting this, these chapters and the, the coverage together? What were your considerations? Martin, shall I a bit? Uh... You can, you may start and then I- Okay, sure. Yeah, thanks, good question. I, I mean, there are pragmatic reasons involved. It's about the length of the book and the manuscript, sure. Um, and as you said, Karen, the, you know, the concepts play also a certain role. But it's also, I think the idea was um, that we more specifically look at countries uh, who are, um, as I think Amar pointed out, uh, connected to each other. So there is still a kind of network of, of goods flowing back and forth, uh, as well as labor remittances play a role. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of connected area uh, within the Middle East. So this was the... the, the the more um, kind of conceptual starting point. We we try to legitimize the case selection in the book, and Iran is is kind of a bit a bit of an outsider of that. Um, so I, I just want to, to add one one thing uh, I, I believe is very important. Um, uh, I was surprised to see that in the in the in the country chapters, which is how diverse uh, uh, reactions and adjustments have been since 2014. So usually we tend to look at at the GCC uh, specifically, but also you know on the more kind of semi rental states as a group of, of countries and, and believe that there are a lot of similarities. But what I learned from as an editor also from the book is that it, it was not really the case. So uh, they, they will have so many different reactions, uh, very specific reactions. And one of the key issues, and this is also important for the future, um, I mean, if we kind of, I mean, there, there will be a, a bust after the, this, this current boom, I believe. Uh, uh, it's also a lesson for, for that period that institutions matter a lot. Uh, and, and I mean, Martin pointed that out, out as one of our key, key findings, among others. Um, and national institutions, you know, how social groups are organized uh, and how, how they are informally and also formally represented will play a role after this monetization has been taking place with the, with the rest of the hydrocarbons. Uh, it's a matter of how this is being spent. And this, this is then, this is then uh, also a matter of social interaction, conflict, uh, and, and here parliaments and other you know, social groups will, will play a certain role. And it will be very interesting to see how this, how this develops over the next decade. Thank you. Martin, would you like to weigh in? Yeah. Oh, okay, I mean, most has been said by, by Thomas. Um, maybe I could just add that, that this, of course, um, contradicts, um, let's say, classic or let's, let us say traditional um, rentier state approach and is at the same time then that an argument um, for further developing um, rent, the rentier state approach in either, I mean, in way that, that, that Matthew suggested, um, we have let's say a slightly alternative view on things, but we, we, we all agree, I think, that traditional rentier state approach doesn't, doesn't get it fully right. And one of the reasons is empirically mentioned and emphasized by Thomas is simply that traditional rentier state approach uh, somehow believed that, that uh, the rentier state um, makes everything I mean, everything the same and it's a big equalizer somehow. I mean, and, and this is something that, that, that our book also sh really shows in, in great empirical detail that there is a whole variety of adjustment policies and you can only explain it when you, when you dive into the history, um, the institutional history of the countries. And, and also Amr, I mean, did this in a great way, I think, uh, with, with Egypt, of course, with a, 
you know that 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 here also the history of of the institution has developed as a response to to oil price decreases and increases that this had a major impact and and um and makes Egypt among other things very different to Jordan and to to Lebanon thanks I think that actually leads to the other question which was posted in uh, in the Q&A, which is about, um, I'm not sure I understand it completely, but would you affirm that the Middle Eastern societies are in trouble because of their lack of consensus and common definitions of economic concepts? And I think that's sort of what you were describing, Martin, is that you know, we have this concept of rentierism, but it doesn't fit easily. And that there are these you know, really interesting sort of dynamics and, and institutional formations that come up as reactions of, um, of, uh, of these uh, uh, energy flows and, and the relationship between exporters and importers and how that affects labor markets and Matthew's ideas and something I've read a lot about in terms of the statecraft and the projection of foreign policy goals through economic means. Um, so I don't know, Amr, do you do you want to kind of kind of parse through that a little bit? Well, uh, the, the, there's the, the familiar dilemma of uh, uh, well, like structure and agency when we are talking about economies that are like well clearly in the in the periphery of the more advanced parts of the uh, of the of the world economy. I mean, like producers of raw materials. Uh, and uh, like the, the Middle East uh, uh, is uh, North Africa, uh, like in, on average, uh, have been inserted into the uh, uh, like world global order as suppliers of uh, mainly uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and the thing is that uh, like the, the chapters on, on Jordan, on Lebanon and on, on Egypt uh, show clearly that uh, like an, an already a known fact. Uh, that uh, this is a whole regional mode of insertion. Uh, and uh, the thing is that this creates constraints, uh, considerable constraints for the producers that are based in many of these diversified economies. Because if, if we talk about uh, an economy like that of, uh, of Egypt uh, or uh, like that of, uh, of, uh, of Jordan, they, they are fairly diversified. I mean, like that uh, uh, overall uh, rents in Egypt, if we add them all together, they would make uh, around 15 to 20% of the GDP, which is sizable, but again, like does not make the whole economy uh, rentier compared to the, to the smaller economies and the ones that are significantly wealthier. But the problem, uh, as we find, is, 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 is very politically economic in, in nature because uh, the external sectors that tie many of these national economies uh, to the rest of the world, if, if, if we ignore just the, the regional connections, uh, are uh, uh, like there is an overrepresentation of these uh, when it comes to international trade, as well as uh, to uh, the kind of investment, uh, the quantity, as well as the quality of investment that they, uh, that they attract. Uh, so uh, this is a problem. So uh, like producers uh, need to be integrated into uh, regional or global value chains. This is the, like, this is the, the, the lesson that uh, most of the global south uh, countries uh, have uh, learned from east asia uh, and uh, if if you have such uh, like a, a mode of insertion that proves to be quite resilient institutionally as well through domestic and regional uh, as well as international uh, arrangements both institutional as well as political then th th there are considerable structural uh, restraints this does not mean that there is no agency at all uh, because, uh, like, uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, there are certain policy changes that could be introduced. There are certain institutional changes that just like require uh, uh, like a, a reconfiguration of uh, many of the uh, ruling uh, uh, social political uh, uh, coalitions in order to uh, uh, like stop uh, distributing value, start looking for ways to produce uh, value. I think that this is happening uh, but on a, on a like in a ve in a very slow manner and uh, in in a way that uh, is not likely to uh, uh, like deliver the, the change that we are uh, looking for so it's it, it's not that uh, they are uh, like perpetual victims because they they, they they are not necessarily so but there are considerable uh, constraints that are by no means unique to the united to to to, to the middle east and north africa uh, if we talk about uh, africa if we talk about south asia if we talk about uh, much of, of South America, uh, but there are problems of, of like redefining their modes of integration in global trade and global capital uh, markets in a way that can deliver development. 
uh, but the restraints are different. Not every uh, region uh, uh, is facing the same restraint. And that's why I think that this book is, is, is really interesting because it, it, it tries to revive the debate about rentierism on a regional scale, uh, where national cases uh, are variations within a rather uh, uh, like more extended regional pattern. Thank you, Amr. And I think that sort of leads nicely to the next question, which popped up, which is sort of this idea of can we even speak of, uh, you know, an, a pan-Arab economy or a Middle Eastern economy? And it's not only the case of Iran that we left out. We didn't talk about Israel. And one of the big changes since we published this book, of course, has been the normalization um, of uh, between uh, Israel and uh, the UAE and Bahrain. Um, and, you know, now the promise of tremendous trade and investment flows between Israel um, and the Gulf. So, you know, does it make sense anymore to speak of this sort of pan-Arab idea of economic unification? Um, certainly within the GCC, we've seen a proliferation of competing economic um, policies um, and, and less unity within the GCC as a, an economic organization. So. Well, I wonder if any of you would like to say something about where you see those trend lines going or, or the regional economy as a whole. Sure. Um, I mean, I think um, probably the last question and this question both point to um, sort of variations of political language in the region. And um, uh, this is something we see in the, in the economic sphere. You know, the, we, our assumption, I suppose, is that political language is going to be predominantly around uh, nationalism and ethno-nationalism and um, say pan-ethno-nationalism like um, uh, pan-Arabism. But um, you know, there's an economic um, place or role, I suppose, for uh, political language. And, and we see this with a lot, like with the, the question on Iran, for example, um, now, the, there's very specific uh, political language that the regime in Iran uses for uh, justifying the economic role of the state and for justifying the economic position of the population. It's, it's very heavily structured still around this idea of the world being a, a bifurcation of the oppressed and the oppressor and of the role of the state to be uh, sort of through welfare type structures to look after the oppressed, whether they're in Iran or whether they're Shia elsewhere in the region or, or what have you. Um, and it contrasts to a substantial degree with the language you get elsewhere. You get in, in many ways quite, quite neoliberal language coming out of the Gulf states, even though the reality likewise is somewhat different to the language. And, the Gulf states can still be rather paternal, but they'll often talk the language of neoliberalism, whether that's perhaps for a Western audience or um, an American audience, or whether that's um, just in terms of uh, a business, a uh, globalized business audience. But uh, but Qatar is, is only one of the Gulf states that seems to speak that sort of language well. Now, whether this sort of stuff, and you know, there's other examples here, you, know, you can point to examples of nationalist or leftist language where often where regimes are actually pursuing neoliberal policies. So there's all sorts of different um, manifestations of this, but I think um, on this third question, where this perhaps, um, what this perhaps points to is that um, there's not just a sort of diminished prospect, I suppose, for Arab economic unity in, in my view, but um, there's even the fact that this is being sort of couched in language that doesn't find a countenance in reality. So it's, it's you know, the language is being used for specific state or regime purposes. And um, and I suspect, therefore, it's the sort of thing that's going to have a fragmentary effect in the region. Uh, it's not something which would contribute to, to unity, I'm afraid to, to say. Well, we just have a few minutes left. Emma, did you want to say something? Yeah, if, if I just like, um, I, I, I think that uh, uh, Thomas's uh, answer uh, does, does make sense because uh, 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 like we, we have this thing uh, that is like rather established in the literature that the Middle East is one of those cases of a region without regionalism. Uh, meaning that there is a, a considerable uh, movement of uh, labor, of capital, of, uh, of like less so of goods and services because most of the economies produce pretty much the same thing and they are not that industrialized. So you, you usually don't have very high levels of trade. But overall, 
uh, you have considerable cross-border trade that is uh, like translocal between different uh, uh, parts. And uh, th th there are regional uh, forms of integration when it comes to the intensity of different forms of economic flows uh, within the Arab region in a way that is not uh, uh, like as intense in relation to Iran or in relation to Turkey, not to mention that they, like, they do have uh, extensive relations with their neighbors. But we can't speak about the Arab world to a great extent, especially, uh, uh, well, like especially the Middle East and Egypt, uh, to, to an extent Libya as, as well, uh, as a region uh, without regionalism. So it's not pan-Arabist uh, or pan-Arab in the, in, the, in the ideological uh, sense of like pushing for Arab unity or, or whatever, but it's just like an element of, uh, uh, it's, it's factual as well as analytical. Like we, we need to understand the patterns that are already uh, uh, there. Um, um, without necessarily excluding others. Uh, the case, of course, with, with Israel is much more uh, uh, problematic. The, 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 not only the, the structure of the Israeli economy is, is so different, uh, but uh, also uh, the, 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 the very strong links that uh, exist between uh, Israel and the, and the United uh, States, uh, well, like make it uh, very much of an, um, an enclave with very limited, uh, uh, like uh, existing, not only because of the political conflict, but the, the, the political conflict that exists with most of its uh, direct neighbors. Uh, uh, so this is like one of the of the factors that uh, would make it uh, quite artificial to try to just like insert Israel into a, a, an analysis, whereas it's it's not really uh, uh, it is definitely part of the of the Middle East, but it's not part of this region uh, and not regionalism. I think we have a topic for another book together. <laughs> It's a really interesting discussion. I'll give the last words to uh, to Martin and Thomas if you'd like to uh, to add anything. Um, I just um, wanted to add something to this. What we discussed um, um, lately now, but that there was in the in this in the nineteen seventies actually when when there was the oil price escalation or oil price revolution, there were a lot of academics and not only academics who dreamt about an integrated um, Middle East. I mean, based on the idea that that uh, the, the Arab Gulf has the, the capital and by the shortage of labor and, and uh, Egypt, countries like Egypt, Lebanon, so the, the opposite, they, they have a lack of capital, but they have more or less qualified uh, labor and it didn't but it didn't work out why didn't it work out i would say because all of these political classes in, in it's a bit generalizing but all of these political classes have, are not really interested primarily in development but in maintaining their political privileged position and maybe this this is a is a bridge to what thomas has to add go ahead thomas any last word <laughs> nice um yeah maybe um slightly but let's see um uh, i'm looking forward to our post webinar discussions in the next book, <laughs> uh, if this is an opportunity. Uh, I'm always ready. But I, I just wanted to say thank you again to all of the uh, authors. Uh, maybe some of them are also listening or um, because without you, we would not have uh, reached that stage to, to have a book like, you know, looking at nine different cases and, and almost all of the Middle East is, is being represented. And then finally, uh, thank you again to you, Karen, for, for hosting this, for making this possible. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you all thank you. Thank yes. you guys for, for doing the work of the, uh, the editorial uh, labor, which is not easy. And, um, and from the Middle East Institute and our new program on, on economics and energy, I just say we would like to invite more investigations of this kind, more publications of this kind. So um, let's continue the collaboration and it's really an honor to, uh, to work with all of you. So thank you so much. Thank you for watching and listening. You can buy the book, uh, Manchester University Press from their website or from uh, your local retailer.